This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Salt. Leaving the last of the orcs dead, you begin to loot their den. You find a few handfuls of stolen coins, a half-full cask of cider, a moldy wheel of cheese, and a few other odds and ends looted from the local farms they victimized. You're about to dismiss the spoils as junk, but the last canvas sack turns out to be a real treasure. It's a full sack of salt, glittering, granular, white gold. This will fetch some real coin. These days, we don't think much about salt. I mean, some of us do. Those of us with blood pressure problems are warned by doctors to be very careful about how much salt we eat, lest our brains explode. But no one else really thinks about what's in that little packet that they're sprinkling over their McDonald's french fries, which just shows how much we take salt for granted nowadays. Because, through the course of human history, salt is second only to water in terms of importance. It is biologically economically, politically, socially, and spiritually the second most important substance on earth. If you need proof, just think about how many idioms we have that involve the word salt. He's the salt of the earth, we say of a pure and hard-working soul. But if we want to raise the lands of the enemy, we salt the earth. If we want to make someone suffer, we rub salt in their wound. Of lazy people, we say they aren't worth their salt. When we go off to the office for the day's work, we head off to the old salt mine. We call sailors old salts. And when someone is angry, we say they're salty. And if we don't think someone's words are worth listening to, we take them with a grain of salt. And that's not all. The word salary actually comes from the Latin word for salt. Why? Because in addition to their pay, Roman soldiers were awarded a bonus called salarium argentum, which literally means salt silver. Contrary to popular belief, this didn't actually refer to the practice of paying soldiers in salt, though some soldiers did actually receive special rations of salt. More often, the phrase referred to actual coins given to the soldier so he could buy salt, salt money. And what about that phrase, worth his salt? That comes to us from the ancient Greeks. And the origin isn't pleasant. It comes from a trade agreement between Greece, and later Europe, and sub-Saharan Africa. Salt for slaves. But what makes salt so valuable? Well, part of it is that it's vital for life. You need salt. Without going into too much biological detail, your body uses salt to maintain fluid pressure in every cell. See, every cell in your body is basically a water balloon, and water can flow somewhat freely into and out of every cell. If too much water flows in, the cell pops. Too little, it shrivels. And salt allows your body to maintain the precise fluid balances. Further, salt is actually a vital component of your nervous system. Salt is what allows every nerve in your brain and body to pass an electrical signal through it. But salt is also an excellent preservative. Remember how salt helps control the flow of water? Well, if you sprinkle salt on something that has a lot of moisture, like raw meat, the salt will pull the water out of it. That's handy because there's stuff that lives in raw meat that will make you very sick. You know, bacteria. If you dry up the water, the bacteria basically dehydrate and the meat stays good longer. Interestingly, for the same reason, salt works like a flavor enhancer. By drawing out moisture, it allows the other chemicals that give food its flavor to concentrate. On top of that, because we need salt to live, and we're constantly losing salt in our urine and sweat in tears, we are biologically programmed to like the taste of salt. In addition, that moisture-controlling power of salt 
also makes it valuable in hundreds of non-food related ways. It was useful for drying out pottery, allowing us to make better earthenware. It was useful for curing animal skins, allowing us to make leather goods. It was useful for preserving bodies, allowing us to make better mummies. And that's just a little tasting menu of all the things salt can do. But this isn't the Industrial and Culinary Biochemist's Word of the Week podcast. You didn't come here to learn about the chemical properties of food additives. You came here to learn about the historical context for salt. But that historical context begins by understanding that salt is vital for human life and for pretty much every industry we've ever developed. It's worth paying a lot for. It's worth fighting for. It's worth dying for. Now, we know that salt was in use by ancient cultures long before they even started writing down their history. The trouble was, salt was kind of hard to come by. Salt is a mineral, and so you had to find it. In rock form, we call it halite. You could find halite deposits exposed on the surface sometimes, but the problem is, salt dissolves very readily in water so exposed salt deposits didn't last for long. Fortunately, water is like the internet. Once something is in there, it stays in there. So in addition to finding halite, either on the ground or in mines, you could boil water, and usually it would leave behind some salt. The ancient Chinese were masters of making salt. As far back as 5,000 years ago, they recorded instructions for extracting and purifying 40 different varieties of salt. They also recognized its physiological importance and wrote numerous texts on its medical uses. For a time, the Chinese Empire's economy was driven by salt taxes. Salt was so vital to the Chinese economy that its discovery was actually written into their folklore. The story goes like this. In China, there is a mythical bird called the Fang Huang. Actually, originally, they were two birds, the Fang and the Huang, male and female. Together, these brilliant, beautiful birds ruled over all other birds. And although the Chinese sometimes called it the August Rooster, we in the West tended to think of it as the Chinese Phoenix. The bird is depicted with five long feathered tails whose colors, black, white, red, green, and yellow, represent the five virtues that Confucius espoused. Those were charity, honesty, wisdom, faithfulness, and etiquette. The story of salt goes thus, though. One day, a Chinese peasant saw a beautiful Fang Huang in his field. He chased after the bird, but it flew off. He found the spot where it flew from and discovered clods of pale dirt. He took the dirt to his wife and she became convinced that it was somehow a treasure. According to the law of the time, if you discovered treasure, you gave it to the emperor as a gift. So the peasant went to the palace and offered the clods of dirt as a gift from the Fang Huang. When the emperor saw it was just clods of dirt, he accused the peasant of trying to insult and deceive him and threw him in prison. The peasant's wife got worried after a while and went to the palace to find her husband. Servants there told her what had happened. The servants took pity on her and told her to run away, but they returned the basket of dirt. She pleaded with them, trying to explain, and during the scuffle, the dirt clods got knocked into the emperor's soup. And with the perfect timing that only characters in folklore and sitcoms display, the emperor demanded his soup at exactly that moment and threatened to execute the cook if there was any delay. The emperor basically used the Queen of Hearts management style, as you can see. The cook had no choice but to serve the soup, and the emperor was so amazed by its flavor that he demanded to get the recipe. And the cook told the truth. It contained the peasant's dirt clods. So the emperor let the peasant go free. Then the peasant showed him where he'd found the dirt. And the story ends there, 
before it has to go into the part where the emperor bulldozed the peasant's farm and built the first salt mine in its place. Uh, I'm sure he paid them very well. But salt isn't just a culinary treasure. It's also a symbol of purity in many cultures. For example, in the biblical book of Leviticus, the faithful are instructed to season all of their offerings to God with salt. And, in fact, this is part of a contract between God and David. Essentially, God granted David and his descendants dominion over the Holy Land of Israel in return for offerings of salt. This covenant of salt is referred to several times in the Old Testament. And the covenant of salt actually relates to an early Middle Eastern practice that spread through much of Europe and Western Asia. The idea was that if you shared salted bread with someone, they owed you loyalty and gratitude. Salt was just too valuable a thing to waste. So you have the Arab phrase, there are bread and salt between us, which refers to an alliance built around the sharing of salted bread. In some cultures, the bread and salt alliance was more than just about cutting deals. It was about welcoming guests. If you offered a guest bread and salt, they were safe in your home and you were safe from them. And this practice is still fairly common throughout the world. Russian weddings include a ceremonial exchange of salted bread between the bride and groom's family. And some real estate agents or landlords in Israel leave a gift of salted bread to welcome new tenants and homeowners. In the Middle Ages, the salt industry basically kept Europe going, and it was extremely important in the United Kingdom. In fact, the suffix witch on the name of a place, like Sandwich and Dunwich, actually meant that salt was made or mined there. Many such witches were found around Cheshire in the UK. That made Cheshire strategically important. After the Romans retreated from Britain, Cheshire spent time under control of Wales, then Mercia, then the Vikings, and then divided between King William of the Normans and the Anglo-Saxon Earl Edwin. And then, during the Rebellion of 1070, William nearly laid waste to Cheshire, but it was able to recover by restarting the salt mines. Beyond the Middle Ages, the search for salt drove much of European exploration, and it fueled colonial trade. It never stopped being vital. Salt taxes helped fuel the French Revolution. When the Dutch blocked the Spanish salt trade with the Iberian Peninsula in the late 16th century, Spain went bankrupt. It ceased to be a global superpower. One of the tactics employed by the British against the American revolutionaries was to starve them of salt. In the 1800s, the Erie Canal was nicknamed the ditch that salt built because it was primarily constructed for salt barges. The point was, if you made salt, you were an economic power. You were a strategic resource. You were vital. And if you needed salt, you were beholden to someone. And that's something we gamers generally don't think about. Strategic resources drive history because most of human history is about the struggle for resources. But when is the last time salt actually came up in your game? Salt has left its grainy and sometimes bloody fingerprints all over history. And yet, when is the last time orcs raided a salt mine or the evil empire blockaded salt? The problem is, nowadays, salt is easy to come by. It's a staple. It's cheap. You can get it anywhere. And it's so cheap and easy that it's become a villain. Salt is responsible for high blood pressure and heart disease. We love the taste because we need it to fuel our biology, but it's not rare anymore. So we overconsume it to the point where it becomes a poison. But once upon a time, salt was worth its weight in gold. Literally. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com.